wonder if the organizer uh, Green Development Fund can also mute participants uh, so that we don't have any interference, unnecessary interference. Um, if you have questions, uh, please enter it in, in through the chat um, and on live streaming and Baidu and also YouTube, uh, we have team uh, from, from Lui Fa Hui who will be collecting uh, your, your questions. First, um, we would like to uh, thank uh, again, you know, the Development Fund in China for hosting this webinar, and we want to thank Dr. Zhou, uh, who has a short video message for all of us. Thank you. Okay. Let's see, Xiaomai, you can post the video, ma. On behalf of China Biodiversity Conservation and the Green Development Foundation, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. All organizers, speakers, and the participants of this special conference. Bushmeat was part of our life in Africa as well as in Asia. But today, we're gathering to this conference to discuss it because we are facing the biodiversity emergency worldwide, including Asia and Africa. And because of the industrial civilization, because of the development of human beings, we are now facing a very, very serious emergency, which was caused by human and the which was destroyed our humans only habitats. That is the reason we gather here because we have a shared future. Because this time this time is the sixth massive massive extinction of the earth, we must work together to tackle the issue to solve our problem and to live our life sustainably. And uh, all animals are a part of our uh, living habitats. We have to give it a second thought. We have to change our way of life, change our way of production. We have to move from the industrial civilization to a new civilization. This new civilization requires we change. This new civilization, we call it uh, ecological civilization. That is a, a brand new way of the world, a uh, view, way of all new living. We have to change our lifestyle. And uh, here, we hope we can jointly to save our world, to make our way of living sustainable. And uh, thank you again, and uh, we will share your view, our view in Asia, in China, on all our platforms. We will work together to live, to make the change. We have a new phrase called the H. BS, human-based solution. Only all the difficulties we are facing today are caused by human, and uh, we only can solve the problem by ourselves, by all human participated uh, solution. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that message. Um, and next, uh, we today it's it's our great honor uh, to have uh, Monsieur Olivier Mouchiette to join us. Uh, Monsieur Olivier has a distinguished career uh, in public service and received uh, numerous international awards. Um, he was the winner, for example, he was the winner of the Climate, uh, Agriculture, and Forestry Challenge by the French Development Agency, um, and he was also a co-laureate of the King Baudouin Foundation 
for corporate governorship and um, and and other awards. And he's an ag agriculture engineer uh, by training, um, and he has been the director general of ICCN. Um, uh, heading over this very important conservation conservation agency uh, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he has diverse expertise uh, ranging from sustainable climate agroforestry, biodiversity conservation, uh, ecosystem restoration to conflict resolution and good governance. Um, and since we're talking about wildlife trafficking uh, today, uh, I must mention that last year under his uh, leadership, a joint operation with the U.S. government led to a seizure of elephant ivory, rhino horn, and pangolin scales worth uh, $3.5 million. You might have read that uh, in the news uh, last November. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Matthew Moshiete. Well, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. <laughs> of course, I am very pleased to hear with you, uh, to be here with you. I hope that uh, everybody can hear me because here in Kinshasa, uh, the internet connection is quite uh, difficult. So uh, I don't want to be too long, but uh, just a few words so that uh, everybody understand the, the whole landscape of uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, as you know, it's a very huge country, and uh, according to the, the, the subject that we are discussing today, it's very important to understand that uh, all around the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you have nine different countries, and so we have 9,000 uh, kilometers of uh, boundaries be, uh, uh, with our neighbors. So this it's very important to understand because at the same time, and as it has been said here in the uh, introduction, we have we have uh, of uh, wild animals and wild flora. So uh, everybody come to us to be uh, provided in a, <coughs> in a endangered species, and we have to protect all these. And uh, that's my job. <laughs> so, uh, as uh, it has been said in the introduction, it's only uh, nine months is now, now with my team that uh, we are trying to understand what are the, the main issues that we have to face. And I, I can assure you in this uh, uh, kind of uh, assembly here that the, 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 the key issues is the, the main issues. And it's, uh, we have to deal, of course, with the 3,200 uh, people that are working directly for the uh, ICCN, but also with the 30 millions of Congolese that are directly impacted by the, the situation of our protected areas all around the country. It's very, very huge, and we have a tremendous impact on the population. And this population is one of the more poorest in the world. So it's quite normal that if we have uh, external influences and we are sitting on a, a treasury of uh, wild animals and wild flora, so it's very easy to be corrupted by all the system and uh, to, to have all these people that, uh, that will produce work just to find uh, uh, bush meat and, uh, and different plants. So uh, to, to tackle this issue, uh, what we are trying to do today with my team is to, uh, to get stronger in the organization of the whole team. And uh, since we came here nine, nine months ago, what we did is uh, an organizational and accountable uh, issue, uh, audit so, so that we know what the, the whole institution really have in, in our belly. <laughs> so it's very important. And from this observation and with uh, multiple interaction with our partners, and this is the reason why I am here today with you, uh, we can um, see together what are we able to do. Uh, because from my personal uh, point of view, this will be very, very difficult to stop totally all the, the traffic and the bush, bush meat question and this, uh, um, this very important question of the, the traffic with the, 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 the big apes here. Of course, it's very important, but 
on the countrywide side, this will be very uh, difficult to stop it totally. But we have to reach a reasonable level, and uh, the more quicker, the more quicker possible. How can we do that? Uh, first, by simply communication and information. Today we are we have a big lack of information and communication, so we have to work on it. Of course, with the modern techniques of communication, such as we are using today, but also with the training of many peoples. And this is one of our main targets. Uh, as I just said a few minutes ago today, uh, ICCN, it, this means directly 3,200 uh, people on the, <clears throat> at the, the, country, uh, the countryside, but it's not enough. So today, from 3,000, we have to go to 6,000 people, but younger, uh, well-trained, well-paid, uh, well put in place to do their work. So this is a very big project that we will launch this year. It's the total reform of the whole uh, people of uh, ICCN. So very important is the, the boundaries of our protected area. Uh, today in Congo, we only have uh, fences on the National Park. Elsewhere, you don't have any fences, and we have a few thousand square kilometers of boundaries that we have to protect to prevent uh, the, the boundaries of the protected is a very, very big issue to materialize the, the boundaries of our system. This is the, the second very big issue. And uh, the, the, the third one, just to be <laughs> a little bit short and not to be too long, but uh, we also have to be more uh, <clears throat> responsible or our on our uh, main capacity of auto financing. Today, the ICCN is depending on external uh, support for more than 90% of, uh, of financial needs. This is not reasonable. And beside this, we have many ways that to make money on ourselves with agroforestry, with uh, production and distribution of energy, uh, with ecotourism, of course, a good ecotourism, not only for strangers, but also for Congolese, and uh, with the uh, climate and carbon financing. Uh, this is one of my specialty, and I'm quite sure that with, with this issue, we are able to produce our own money and so that we can finance our own project. This is very important uh, according to the, the, the subject we are discussing today. And the four main pillars that we have to address, it's the biodiversity itself. We have to uh, improve our knowledge of the natural world, fauna, flora. We have to uh, get stronger in the knowing of the, all these system in which we are living. And I think we have to address very seriously uh, the paradigm of the living together of men and nature. And here in our big country, we are one of the best places in the world to do that. And we will do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monsieur Moschetti. Um, really new leadership, uh, new hope. Um, and thank you so much for laying out uh, all the ambitious and really exciting work ahead of ahead of you um, and also the ICCN team. Uh, next, um, I am turning the floor uh, to Adams Kasinga. Uh, Adams is the founder of Conserve uh, Congo. Uh, it's an organization uh, under his leadership, has uh, many young wildlife activists fighting a poaching on wildlife trafficking, um, and they specialize in investigations um, and also sting operations. Uh, obviously, it's dangerous work uh, that we know. Um, and Adams um, is an alumnus of the prestigious uh, YALI program, uh, which is Young African uh, Leaders Initiative. And he was also a Mandela Washington Fellow, uh, which is a program funded by the U.S. Uh, State Department. Um, and it's actually, it was through his attendance of the Mandela Washington Fellow uh, Fellowship that I first uh, met uh, Adams. 
uh, here in the U.S. Um, I don't know if uh, Adams uh, remember this, but uh, we, you know, went to the Ivory Crush uh, in Central Park um, in, in New York City. Um, and I also later had the pleasure um, of welcome him, uh, him to my house uh, for dinner. Uh, so this uh, was very nice uh, memories. And it's really good to see uh, Adams and his team are, are fighting so hard uh, for wildlife on the front lines. Um, in the DRC. And so Adams, I'm turning the floor uh, to you now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Iris. I vividly remember those moments. And uh, you forgot to tell them that we did record a song <laughs> improvisation on that evening. Yes, we uh, did. Yes, that's right. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon to uh, Director General Muschete. It's such a pleasure for us to be here and to be discussing uh, the issue of bushmeat in general and that of wildlife trafficking, uh, particularly with uh, nature lovers and people who are enthusiastic about uh, preservation and protection of wildlife. My name is Adam Skasinga, representing Conserve Congo, which is a local nonprofit and uh, involved in the fight against the scourge of wildlife trafficking as well as uh, in the DRC. We have been in existence for the last 10 years, uh, but we... I think we are losing Adams. I'm hoping that he will come back. Um, if Adams doesn't come back shortly, then I will go to um, the next speakers, Itzaso and Frank. Um, all right. Um, I think Adam Adams did freeze and now he's gone. All right. Uh, so uh, I am going to move along the program while we wait for uh, Adams uh, to come back. And so next, um, we have the, the, the perspective um, of wildlife uh, sanctuaries. Um, as I said earlier, um, when I started the, the webinar, is that uh, sanctuaries, wildlife sanctuaries um, are also, you know, on the front line combating wildlife trafficking um, and also poaching. And, um, and today we have um, two speakers uh, in the DRC who run uh, primate sanctuaries and they are part of the PASA network. Uh, uh, first, uh, Frank, um, he is originally of French origin and Frank and his wife, Roxanne, uh, they are founders um, of Jacques, uh, which, which is the Jean d'Animaux Confisqué au Katanga. And he arrived in the DRC in, in the 90s and quickly noted the extent of chimpanzee trafficking in Lubumbashi. And that really sowed the seeds of his passion for chimpanzee protection and primate protections. He created Jacques in 2006 uh, so that the sanctuary can be a rehabilitation center for chimpanzees uh, that were confiscated from the illegal trade. And today, uh, Jacques Sanctuary has more than 80 confiscated primates. Um, and I know that, you know, in addition to caring for primates, uh, Jacques also has care for endangered pangolins and, and parrots and other animals uh, rescued from the seizures in collaboration with ICCN, Conserve Congo, and other partners. Um, so first, I will go to Frank, and then next will be uh, Itzatso. Thank you, Iris. Um, good afternoon to everybody. General Director Olivier Mouchete, good afternoon. I am Franck Chantreau. I am the founder of uh, Jack. Uh, it's a non-profit organization. It's a Congolese NGO engaged in the fight against the extinction of endangered species that my wife and I started in 2006 with the first chimpanzee ever confiscated in Lubumbashi. 
the second largest city of the DRC. As soon as we arrived in Lubumbashi in 94, we indeed were horrified to see the tragic fate of baby chimpanzees taken from their families, offered for sale for little money in the street or even trafficked across the Zambian border. This is why for 10 years, I personally conducted a non-official study on the trafficking of great apes in Lubumbashi. This study gave more than alarming results since baby chimpanzees were arriving in town to fill the demand for exotic pets or they were transiting through the town to go to Zambia, South Africa, or elsewhere in the world. Also, these results of this study were very worrying. I sadly, realized that per month, almost three chimpanzees were passing through Lubumbashi, which became at that time a real hub of the ape trafficking. If we consider that an average of 10 chimpanzees are slaughtered to remove only one of them from the wild, about 30 chimpanzees are killed per month and more than 400 per year. Over that period of its civic investigation, sorry, trafficking via Lubumbashi alone accounted for the extermination of more than 4,000 wild chimpanzees. This is why in 2006, we created a rehabilitation center for confiscated chimps in Lubumbashi. Yes, a center which is on the one hand will oblige the authorities to apply Congolese wildlife laws by confiscating chimpanzees from traffickers, private individuals, and which on the other hand would make it possible to ch shelter and rehabilitate them. But our beginnings were far from easy, you know, when you want to enforce the law, you don't, you don't just make friends. In five months, at the beginning of 2006, the Congolese state has entrusted us with five baby chimps that we were searing for at our own expense. Among these babies was Jack, the first confiscated baby. We had asked for logistical and financial assistance from major institutions in favor of nature and wildlife, but none of them took us seriously. Nobody helped us. Unfortunately, in September 5th, 2006, a criminal act took place in which two baby chimpanzees were murdered and burned to alive. The first dead baby was Jack, the first baby our whole story began with. It was a terrible shock, and it was obvious that we had to make a decision. Were we go going to continue to save these species? or were we going to vindicate these criminals and stop our rescue action? This is why in October 2006, we legally created Jack and gave the name of the NGO in memory of the baby who died in the fire. Since the creation, Jack has one main goal, to stop the illegal trade in endangered species in the Bumbashi and later elsewhere in the country. To do so, Jack has set itself several missions to achieve this goal. First, to enforce existing laws related to the protection of endangered Congolese species. Then to give refuge to these animals traumatized and confiscated by the Congolese authorities. Then raise public awareness of the cause of endangered species. And finally, if possible, reintroduce individual ineligible for release into the natural habitat. Also, from the beginning, Jack has always worked in close collaboration with its partners, the Congolese Institute for the Conservation of Nature, and with the Ministry of the Environment. Today, we can certify that thanks to the joint efforts of both the Congolese authorities and Jack, we are the only center for primates to have stopped the rebel trafficking of chimps in Lubumbashi, which I remind you was a hub for the legal trade of great apes and chimpanzees in particular. The last confiscation in Rubumbashi dates from April 2014. But Jack is more than just a sanctuary, because over these 16 years of existence, the NGO has always been committed to the fight against the extinction of endangered species. To give you an example, in 2016, we participated in the largest ivory seizure in Katanga. However, our action doesn't stop there. Jack has since 2021 become a rehabilitation center for all kinds of primates, thanks to our determination and that of the Congolese, Zambian, and Zimbabwean authorities 
whom I would once again like to thank for their involvement in this case. And thanks to our partners, we were able to achieve the largest repatriation of primates from the African continent to their country of origin, the DRC. Indeed, remember at the beginning of September 2020, when all the countries were locked down and had stopped importing animals into their country, a Congolese truck illegally took 29 young monkeys out of the DRC to send them to South Africa and probably to China. The truck was intercepted in Chirundo by Zimbabwean official. The cargo included seven different species of primates, including rare, endemic, and endangered ones, and the animals were numbered only 25, as four had already died. The free traffickers had taken documents, fake documents, and they were arrested and imprisoned. Apparently, this was already the sixth time they had taken this route and fraudulently exported primates out of the DRC. From then on, with the authorities and our partners, I did everything possible to bring these animals back to the country. And after five long months of waiting to obtain the documents, I went to pick up by road to bring them back to DRC. As you can see, it's not just the great apes that are trafficked. Our country is full of highly coveted endemic primate species, and many of them are leaving the country for the Middle East, for China, passing by South Africa. This is also very alarming when you think of the bacteria and viruses that these animals can carry. Imagine all these monkeys stuck in small boxes in their dirt with dead and rooting individuals. Imagine the biological bomb that this represents at destination when people open the boxes and release the monkeys. I, I remind you the case of COVID-19. Until now, the virus origin is still unknown. But one of the most reliable hypotheses is the contamination between human being and a wild animal. Personally, the ongoing pandemic is just a warning for humanity. If we don't learn from this terrible experience, many more viruses from the Congo forest or elsewhere in the world can arise and be more devastating. It's therefore urgent that at the global level, all countries commit to stop the illegal trade of endangered species. Because not only they are protected, but they are also prohibited to possess, to import, and to export them. By buying them, you are complicit in the slaughter of several individuals of the family, and therefore you are responsible for the decline of these species in a natural habitat. To me, all that is happening today and everything that we see today is only the tip of the iceberg. How many individuals die before reaching the final destinations? How many individuals actually leave the country each month and arrive to their destinations? Jack today is determined as before to be a key element in ending all this tragedy. But we can't do it alone. We need you to accomplish this heavy task, just how we need you to help us look after all these orphans that we regularly collect and who result from all this traffic. Today, Jack takes care of 81 primates. A dozen others are on the waiting list to be repatriated, but we can't take them all at once because we haven't reached, we have reached full capacity. We need means to build new facilities and we need funds to re rehabilitate all these orphans. Jack has just been offered an island in the middle of the Congo River. This new project is a glimmer of hope and is a titanic project because it will save lives while, while releasing others. But this is a huge project who requires legal support and significant financial resources. We rely on you and thank you everybody for your attention.
Uh, thank you, Frank, uh, for for these uh, remarks. Um, it's you know really a, a very poignant a reminder, especially we're still in the middle of a pandemic. The consequences that um, the, uh, wildlife trade could pose, especially illegal wildlife trade, uh, could pose uh, on um, human health as well. Um, and also, it's you know it's never easy to to hear the the story. I've heard it before. How Jacques, you know, started, um, but you know, it's just it's it's never easy to uh, to to remember those uh, details. Um, and next, um, I will go to um, another uh, Pasa Sanctuary, so it's Atso, um, and then I will come back to to Adams uh, to to wrap up before the Q and A. So Itzato is the technical director of uh, Louis Road uh, Sanctuaries, uh, located in Eastern uh, DRC. And Itzato um, is, has been working with primates for more than a decade uh, across the world, really. Um, she has worked with howler monkeys in Mexico um, and then also working with chimpanzees in Guinea. And now she's based uh, in the DRC. And Itzato uh, manages a wide range uh, of programs including community development projects and rescuing and rehabilitating chimps and also diverse uh, monkey species. Uh, for those uh, less familiar with the Louis Road uh, Sanctuary, uh, it is situated uh, just a few kilometers away uh, from Kahuzi Biega National Park, which is defined uh, by the IUCN as uh, one of the world's uh, third most important site uh, for the conservation of the eastern uh, chimpanzee subspecies, uh, making uh, the sanctuary uh, Louis Road the ideal location for rewilding rescue uh, chimpanzees. Um, and it's a very important foothold uh, for the community and cons uh, community conservation engagement. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, and also Frank uh, touched upon um, as well, is that sanctuaries um, do more than just caring for animals. They have a variety of, uh, of programs from anti-poaching uh, to community engagement. And I'm especially myself uh, touched uh, that Louis Rose program, community engagement programs, uh, pr prioritizes women's uh, empowerment, including providing support and counseling for uh, victims of uh, domestic violence. And so it's also, uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Iris. And thank you everyone for this opportunity to, to talk about what's going on in DRC, to talk about what we are suffering here in the ground. Bonjour, director. <laughs> and uh, yes, as you say, Iris, I'm Itzaso and I'm the director of Luiro. Luiro was created by two Congolese institutions, ICCN and CRCN, so we are very proud to say that it's a Congolese initiative. Uh, it was created after the Second War of Congo, so we need to think also that the population was already suffering, but they did an effort to create a safe place for orphans, because during the war, of course, wildlife suffered the insecurity, and they were appearing more and more orphans around Kausibiega National Park. So today we work as a tripartite um, system, where we have the two Congolese institutions, and then there are the international NGOs to support their job. Uh, we are a multi-species sanctuary. Uh, we have now 113 chimpanzees and 107 monkeys of 16 different species, but we also take care of 118 parrots, great parrots, that we hopefully release soon a group of 14 cows uh, The last years, we are only seeing the number of rescues increasing. Last year, where we received 15 chimpanzees, that was the worst number in the history of Luiro. So sanctuaries are a thermometer for what's going on in the forest, and meaning that if we are receiving more and more orphans, there are more and more chimpanzees dying in, in Congolese forest. So we need to act because uh, it's alarming what we are suffering. Jack, Luiro, Lola Yabonovo, we are seeing the number of, of orphans increasing. Uh, we also need to take into account that 
The number of chimpanzees uh, bonobos that we found are a very small percentage of what what exists. We know there are hundreds of chimpanzees being kept in very bad conditions around the country. Uh, we need to chimpanzees are in danger, and uh, there are about 110,000 chimpanzees, uh, Easter chimpanzees. 93% uh, of them are in DRC. So DRC is a very important country for chimpanzee conservation. Uh, the main issue we are suffering in DRC is the bush meat, which means that poachers kill the adult for to eat, for meat, and then the babies they found in the group, they try to sell them as pets. Some of them are sold locally, but others are going to the international market. And for what we know, the main exporting countries or areas are uh, Middle East and Asia. And in Asia is China, Thailand, and Vietnam. So their governments also need to help us to protect the chimpanzees in DRC. They have a, a big responsibility for what's going on also. Uh, of course, uh, deforestation and human pressure is a, is, is a big challenge. As the director said before, Congo is a very populated country, and the pressure towards the, the natural resources is increasing. But we also need to, everyone is, is responsible for what's going on in DRC, and we need to also take a responsibility for the traffic of wood. Uh, and uh, as we say also, DRC is, uh, it has challenges as uh, insecurity, and that proves that the rebel groups is, are mostly living in, in the forest now where they serve with the chimpanzees, and these rebels, they are armed and they, they, they hunt to eat. So that's a big issue for us, as well as the mining. Uh, so the good, we have good examples as uh, for government implication. Until, two, until the year 2000, a lot of chimpanzees were, live chimpanzees were going to, to Europe, no? And uh, the country of entering was Spain. But right now, what we think is that that uh, traffic stopped and it's only 10, 20 years ago. So it means that if the government uh, make up uh, law enforcement and make efforts, we can stop international trafficking. But on the other hand, we also know that Europe is a, a big uh, import um, continent for bush meat. There are thousands, uh, and we don't even know how much bush meat enter in Europe every every day, every year. So, as Frank say, the government needs to be very implicated in this issue because it means that I mean it's a real dangerous for human population. This tons of bush meat that are entering every year in Europe and in other parts of the world. So government needs to protect the human population of their countries. <clears throat> uh, I would say also, like, not only for the One Health perspective, but governments need to take seriously the problem of pets, uh, wildlife pets, because as, as Frank said, they are also bringing uh, disease, but also they are very dangerous. I mean, I think people doesn't really realize what it means to have a chimpanzee in their houses. They are, for to begin, very demanding. I mean, having a chimpanzee in your house is 24-hour job. And uh, not only that, but when they grow up, because they are social animals. They need to live in their families in the forest. But because we are keeping them in cages, they have really psychological serious um, consequences. So they become very dangerous. And we have seen around the world cases where chimpanzees attack the, the, the owners. No, So this is also to take into account and to do awareness in the population that chimpanzees are not pets. And not any wildlife are good pets. So to end up, my recommendations will be government implication, law enforcement, to stop all kind of wildlife trafficking alive 
or death and uh, awareness for for people to understand what it means to have wild animals in their houses i think people don't don't really know what it means and uh, we need to to do something to push instagram and facebook to stop sharing these videos about chimpanzees uh, dress up uh, monkeys being used uh, as clones, like Instagram and Facebook needs to forbid these videos. They are causing uh, a lot of damage. And uh, they they push people to think that chimpanzees or primates are good pets, and they are not. So all, all of us needs to report these videos. And of course, our daily decisions as consumers, we have the power, we have the power to change things. So every day when we go to the supermarket. We have the power to to stop the the deforestation and to stop uh, the environment destruction. So please just think every day about Africa, about Congo, and about the rest of the world. And thank you for hearing me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Sato. Um, especially, you know, a host of recommendations uh, that you know we can do, corporations can do, um, and also uh, governments can 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 join together to combat these issues uh, with NGO support. Uh, and now we have Adams back. I hope the the connection is better now. Um, so, Adams, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much and very sorry about that. Uh, this is how we live. Uh, the connection is not always the best. Yeah, as I was still saying, yeah, we are the only organization on the ground fighting the scourge of wildlife trafficking in the DRC and probably in the region of Central Africa. Uh, the existence of Conserved Congo was motivated by the void which existed uh, in that part of conservation. Uh, we particularly took a trip down the Congo River in 2013, and I came back with a camera, and it's only when I sat down and I went through those pictures that I realized that the problem was bigger than what we thought. And at this stage, we did not know what to do, but uh, we organized ourselves, and we started preaching the gospel of conservation within our communities. And this allowed us to gather a group of other like-minded people in our community. And therefore, today, Conserve Congo is sitting at a personnel of about 104 volunteers. And we've been volunteers for the last decade. Uh, some of us are on a full-time basis. Some of us are on a part-time basis. And we control the entire national territory meaning that we are at all borders, we are in the airports, we are in the cities, we are in rural areas, and we work on tip-offs. And once we receive a tip-off, we start investigations. And these investigations, the results uh, named intelligence is shared with, uh, with the authorities. And when I talk of the authorities, I mean our biggest partner, ICCN. We share with the police, as well as the intelligence service. In return, they assist us in making a race in a sting operation. And most of these cases are brought before court. The results of our 10 years are sitting at uh, this position. So far, we have uh, made seizures of uh, six tons of ivory, uh, 5.5 tons of pangolin scales, Nine, 96 great apes, 11 live pangolins, 194 feline skins, 365 birds, seven reptilians, 17 okapi skins, 24 liters of okapi oil. And in the process, we have worked on over 6,000 cases of wildlife trafficking in and around the DRC. And surprisingly, only 10% of that has reached prosecution. That is quite minute compared to the efforts that we put into the work. 
And of course, we have managed to put 324 traffickers behind bars. I'm talking about cases which were prosecuted. Uh, most cases are, are being affected by uh, incidents of uh, corruption. And sometimes, unfortunately, they do get uh, scot free. And in the process, we have managed to dismantle major networks of wildlife trafficking across the country. But you may wonder, what is the causes of wildlife trafficking? The causes are many, but we are going to cite only three, which we have seen are very much prominent. The strategic geolocalization of the DRC. We are the only country in Africa which has got nine borders. And just like uh, the DG has mentioned earlier, most of our borders are very porous and very uncontrolled. And this allows movements of in and out of individuals that we do not even know. And therefore, that makes the DRC not only a major source for wildlife uh, products, but it makes us a very huge trans transiting point for the same product. For instance, at this stage, even though we do not have a single rhino alive, the DRC is the country that has got the most rhino contraband in Africa currently. Not many people know that, but we can uh, surely tell you that from our investigations. We've got another major problem of corruption. In fact, we do believe that corruption is the greasing mechanism for the wildlife trafficking machinery. That without corruption, you wouldn't even talk about any form of trafficking. In the DRC, trafficking is so rife that it has become second nature. Brown envelopes are exchanging hands at the expense of our wildlife. And of course, the third point is going to be injustice and lawlessness. We are the only country where we have a law, but which is never applied. It is in the last 10 years, with the pressure that we have applied on our course in the justice system, that we have seen a little improvement. And of course, we shouldn't uh, deny the fact that the partnerships that we are reinforcing between us and government and other governmental institutions have increased uh, the fact that courts are now taking our issues and the issues particularly of wildlife very seriously. You're going to be wondering as to what kind of species we work on. We work on all species, especially species which are protected here in the DRC and internationally. We work on uh, elephants and pangolins, which have a destination of China and Vietnam, mainly. But we will not forget the bushmeat. Bushmeat is an issue that is being forgotten. Bushmeat has evolved. Bushmeat is no longer a small cultural aspect. Bushmeat has evolved and it is no longer a subsistence mechanism. It is making more money than ivory and pangolin scales. Every week we have at least 15 tons of bushmeat leaving Kinshasa alone, entering the EU zone, and sometimes even reaching the US of A. Bushmeat, once is smoked, every species looks like bushmeat. Therefore, it becomes difficult to differentiate species and subspecies. And speaking to one of uh, the traffickers of bushmeat, international traffickers of bushmeat, it was revealed to us that they do have a technique of cutting off the hoofs, the claws, and the head. And therefore, a pangolin will end up looking like a, a giant rat a chimpanzee will end up looking like a little monkey. But then, not all little monkeys are just ordinary monkeys. The DRC is a biodiverse country where we still have a lot of primates which are highly protected, yet they are not great apes. We also have birds and apes which head to Pakistan, Lebanon, and the majority of the Arabian Peninsula. We also have great apes going to Asia in majority and China particularly. We also have an issue with the okapi. The okapi is the new in thing for traffickers. And as you may have realized, the okapi is the only endangered 
species which is not on the CITES list. And therefore, at this stage, we are trying to fight that the Okapi be put on that list. The Okapi is being murdered at a very high rate. If you look at our statistics, you're going to see that it is an animal that is keeps recurring. And this animal is being killed for many other reasons other than the skin. It is being killed for its meat. It's being killed for its fat. It's even being killed for its bones. It is a, an, an animal which is endemic to the DRC, which is very, very little known across the globe, but also which we as the Congolese people have not really given the value that it deserves. We must talk about our strategic partnerships because we couldn't achieve what we have achieved without all the sanctuaries that we work with. And here I'm seeing Jack, I'm seeing Luiro, and the others. First of all, I must mention the fact that without these sanctuaries, for us to rescue live animals is going to be futile because then what do we do with them after rescuing them? And these sanctuaries are doing a very amazing work because theirs is a continuation of our work. And they keep giving the work that we do a lot of added value because then they take care of these uh, animals for the rest of their lives. And I even think that the future of this country's wildlife is going to depend on those sanctuaries because at one point we may look into the wild and there will be nothing to save anymore. I am not going to forget the synergy that we have made with government. Since the new leadership of ICCN, we have realized that there has been a fast tracking of procedures not only in rescues, but also in sting operations. We are lucky enough to have a leadership that is involved. And for the first time today in the DRC, civil society, government, and other parastatals, we can sit down and have a plan to preserve our wildlife, which is a natural heritage for us and for our grandchildren. I really would like to commend uh, DG Mushiete for all the efforts that he's putting, mainly the collaboration that he's giving to us as the civil society. And therefore, our recommendation is going to be, we should keep reinforcing the synergy that we currently have. We're still going to be working together because wildlife trafficking has become so complex. And once a problem is complex, it requires a complexity of uh, solutions. And the way we are currently working, we think that it is the way to go about it. Conserve Congo has also established, Conserve Congo has also established uh, partnerships with uh, neighboring countries such as Congo, Brazzaville, Uganda, Zambia, and Tanzania. And that allows us to pursue criminals even when they cross our borders and run into our neighboring countries. And those partnerships have allowed us to make arrests and even have prosecutions. Uh, the typical example is the recent seizure of 126 Paris, which we worked on with other partners. And uh, I must inform you that the case was concluded this morning uh, with a sentencing of seven years to the culprit. We are really glad and proud of the work done, and we think that is going to send a very strong message to traffickers never to attempt that again. Even though we think that we have achieved so much, we still believe that we can achieve more. However, we face obstacles in our work, and one of the obstacles we face is funding. Unfortunately, sometimes we feel like funding is not getting to the bottom at the grassroots level where it's supposed to have an impact. And we as Conserve Congo, we are in dire need of funding in order to be able to put these bad guys behind bars, in order to be able to save these great apes. order to be able to keep the fire burning so that our people does not get discouraged. We also have an obstacle of uh, corruption. 
corruption is a big problem. And even though we try and save wildlife, in the process, fighting corruption is part of the work that we do. Because fighting corruption is also trying to ensure the safety and security for wildlife. Thank you so much for listening to us. And if you'd like to know more about us, please uh, follow us on social media. And you can also email us to request some of the reports which we've produced in terms of the work we do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Adams, and congratulations on the um, to everyone who was involved in the in the conclusion of the prosecution that you mentioned uh, this morning. Um, we will take um, three questions, and if the speakers can summarize your answers, um, that will be great. Um, and also, I want to also thank the audience uh, and members in, in Asia. I, you know, we have several hundred people listening in on stream, uh, live streaming in Asia. So um, these questions first, um, as Adams uh, was just talking about bushmeat and all the speakers uh, mentioned uh, the challenges and problems with bushmeat. And so the question is, um, and this, you know, the, the three speakers that are here, uh, please do feel free to, to answer, um, is that the culture of uh, the aspect, the cultural aspect of bushmeat uh, is one of the most difficult uh, issues to address. And so what are your views on that? And this is a question that actually, you know, I've I've heard a lot um, from um, when I interact with especially policy makers uh, in the Western government. So I think, you know, the cultural aspect of the bushmeat is something that we could use your insights. So I don't know if Adams, you can, you want to speak first or, and then it's also and Frank. Yes. Um... There is a cultural aspect to bushmeat, just like there is a, a cultural aspect in everything that surrounds us. However, um, at this stage, we cannot keep saying that uh, there is a cultural rights which requests us to kill uh, a chimpanzee for it to take place. There is none. We have discovered that most people, especially here in the DRC, who live around national parks, They've been eating wildlife because that's the only thing which was available to them. And today we have evolved and uh, we can be able to farm uh, other domestic animals. And I don't think there will be anybody who would prefer to go and eat monkey meat if they can have access to a great piece of steak. I do understand that to a certain extent. There is that uh, belief, I would even call it a superstition, where some people will tell you that if you eat a gorilla meat, it gives you that spirit within you. And I wouldn't say that is culture. I would call that um, a misconception, which needs to be addressed. So for me, to be able to counter that, there are only two ways. There is education, and second, we need to give the people an alternative. Once we give them an alternative way of uh, sup uh, supplementing their, uh, their meat need, uh, mainly protein, and I think that issue can be an issue of the past. But there is no cultural value really based on, on, uh, on, uh, on wild meat. Otherwise, we can do it the South African way. They do have uh, game reserves where they farm wildlife for people who prefer eating game meat. We can also do that here in the DRC, but there is no cultural point there at all. They eat wildlife because that's what is available. All right, thanks Adams. Uh, it's also in Frank, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, I, I just wanted to say also um, uh, with Adams, uh, I agree with him, you know, it's not anymore cultural. Um, when you see a city like uh, Kinshasa, Lagos or Yaoundé, 
uh, with I, I, I can't I don't know how many millions of people are living there and you see the boats who are reaching these cities every day with tons and tons of bushmeat you know I think this is a, this is going to become a real big problem in the next few years maybe the next decade because the, how the forest can still you know how we can find so much bushmeat uh, today uh, so I think this is very serious for African governments. Uh, they will reach a point where nothing will be left in the wild, which is the case today in DRC. We, we call now empty forests. You don't have even a, an insect or, or a squirrel or, or a rat. So, and you know, you have millions, millions of people. The population is growing so fast. Kinshasa is a huge city. And uh, so we, if we are not careful, very careful, um, it will be a very big problem for, for the people, you know, living in Africa because no meat will be left. So it, it's it's urgent to to find a solution. And uh, it's difficult to answer that question because we don't have the answer. And um, that's it. Okay. If that's all, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm agree with my colleagues, and I will add that it's very important the, the awareness and the information because a lot of people doesn't know the law and doesn't know that there are certain species who are fully protected. So we have cases like Lomami National Park where some hunting is, uh, is allowed, but in a very regulated way. And of course, uh, protected species are not allowed to be hunted. So that is why it's very important to support ICCN in awareness and in law enforcement, because these people who hunt uh, gorillas or chimpanzees, they need to have uh, the law uh, enforced. And the, so that will create an awareness for all the people in the country. You know, if this uh, penalties goes in the media and, and they say, look, this guy hunt a gorilla and now he's in prison for 20 years. So this is very important right now that the law is enforced. Okay, thank you, Itzatso. Um, I will move on to the to the next uh, question, and we should be wrapping up soon. So this is the last question uh, from Rowan uh, World uh, Parrot Trust. So Rowan was asking um, about um, trafficking of live uh, birds, endangered uh, parrots, and, and other wildlife. They're often um, exported using fraudulent uh, permits. I, I think Adams or other speakers have uh, touched upon that. So what can be done um, in terms of addressing, you know, using fraudulent permits? Uh, this is probably, you know, touched upon uh, corruption. And so that's the first part. And then second is that, you know, given the concern about the spread of bird flu um, and other infectious uh, disease uh, for uh, zo of zoonotic uh, origins, um, does it make sense in your view to allow any export of live birds for exotic pet trade. Um, Frank, perhaps you want to go first about the fraudulent permits, if you've seen that, or, you know, about parrots. Uh, you, you talk about, you know, you've come to, to cross so many, you know, parrots under your care. Yeah, no. Um... Thank you, Iris. Uh, it's also is the is the one with the parrots, and yes, we saw many parrots also. But the law in the DRC is very complicated for for parrots where we are. But regarding fake documents, yes, it's difficult to to say anything. You know, is uh, but what is more often incredible is that you have also you know people who are responsible. I mean, especially for people who are at the custom, uh, at the borders, it's not even needed to have a fake document. They just change the name of the animals. So who who can make a difference between a monkey and, and a chimpanzee? Uh, you know, the, the, the people who are supposed to do this job are not trained to do so. So they are not, and you know how complex it can be 
Uh, of course, everybody can recognize who are attending now this meeting, what is the difference between a chimpanzee and a mangabe. Uh, but for people who don't know anything about wildlife, it's so complicated to just uh, with all species and subspecies in monkeys, parrots, reptiles, it's difficult to make, uh, to choose which one is in danger, which one is not, and which one is fully protected. So I think it's a lot of things to, to do to train the people, the officers who are in charge of customs. And, uh, and yes, to regulate uh, CITES, uh, this is also, uh, you know, fake documents so, or even real documents that are, are used many times for the same expedition. People are using the same permit. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a lot of things going on with uh, with CITES all over the planet and and, and people you know the, the the people who are doing this trade they know that they know the failures so i think this is something which may be addressed at the CITES meeting you know um, because people are taking profit on that and uh, and i think uh, for birds uh, for parrots it also can better uh, and adams of course uh, can better answer your question than me Yep. Yes. Thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, so it's also, uh, and also Adams, uh, if, if you can get ready for addressing uh, the fraudulent permits um, and also the exotic pet trades, especially in parrots. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm agree. I think CITES needs to think, rethink the system. Uh, sometimes it's almost becoming a tool, you know, to have a CITES permit. Okay, uh, it also is having connection issue. Um, so it seems to be taking turns, but you know, we will just wrap it up. So Adams, if you can address, uh, summarize your, 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 you know, you have so much experiences on, in these regard. Right, thank you so much. We have, uh, we have realized that there are so many permits uh, that are in the wrong hands and the permits can be only issued by one organ, which is the CITES office. Previously, I think about two or three years ago, uh, yes, there were so many permits which were being issued on purpose. We don't know by which mechanism, but clearly there was a bit of corruption. However, today, uh, the CITES office within ICCN has sorted out a lot of things. So every permit, in fact, the portal is open to the public and we can verify permits online. That is a good thing, but it does not stop people from using those permits. So there is this uh, wildlife union of, of traders of wildlife, which is recognized legally in the DRC, and they get their permits from the CITES office. However, those permits, when they issued to transport green pigeons, and we end up finding gray parrots in the crates, who are we to blame? So we think that that union of wildlife traders, which is a legal entity, is the gateway to fraudulent other species which are protected to get out of the country on fake permits. We have come across a number of those permits. Usually the permit is registered, but it's got a different species. Let's say a permit is going to be taking out two monkeys. It ends up to be two chimpanzees. And usually I'm talking about the permits which we discover. I'm not talking about permits which manage to export. The guy who was arrested in Uganda recently, he had the same permit. And CITES DRC confirmed to us that he came to ask for a permit for green pigeons, but he didn't push green pigeons, he pushed African greys. So I think there has to be talks between us as conservationists with the local CITES and to have a frank conversation with them that for as long as you allow these people to be sending out monkeys, great apes are going to be going through those permits. 
Um, yes, Adam, that's, um, yeah, taking these notes. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of conversations need to be happening. Awareness, you know, of even the, the of officials um, who are issuing the permits and also people who should be verifying these permits uh, when the transaction and export actually taking place is needed. Um, okay, so just uh, just two more minutes, if, if possible. Uh, it's also if you can wrap it up uh, two more Two, two minutes about um, this issue, the parrot issue. Thank you. Now, uh, I was going to add that, uh, for example, Adam, he knows where the trafficking is, is going on. He knows where the outside ponds are, but he needs resources to be able to be there, to be able to to act. So sometimes it's, it's a, just a matter of money, no? having the res economical resources to be able to work uh, because we are ready, we, are, we want to act, but sometimes it's the resources. Yes, it's also, yes, um, I think, you know, that's really a good way to sum up um, today's uh, webinar is that conservation is, is not cheap, um, you know, and, but, you know, because we are the stewards of the planet with so much natural resources that we need to protect this planet. So we, the investment um, is much needed, um, not just for our own sake, but also for the, the sake of the future generations and the health of our planet. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, I am saying this is possibly the first of a, a series of more discussions about uh, the wildlife uh, biodiversity conservation issues in the DR and I want to thank all our speakers uh, for participating and also audience members. Uh, we have a number of, you know, very also well-known conservationists uh, here uh, among us in the audience and, of course, hundreds of listeners um, listening in uh, across um, Asia and possibly Europe as well and within the DRC. Um, so this is just the beginning of collaborations, um, the continued collaborations, I would say, among conservation organizations and also um, in support of government agencies in tackling these issues. Um, so finally, I want to again, you know, thank you so much for your time uh, and we will see you sooner than later, I'm sure. All right. Bye, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. <laughs> great, great presentations. Hello, Recording Ian. stopped. Thank you. I thought the recording stopped. We could have a chat, but um, it depends on this. We're still being streamed. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I am uh, so sorry we didn't have time for your uh, very uh, interesting questions. Uh, I hope. Uh, oh, it's okay. I was just feeding them into the chat. I don't, I don't know how many. Samuel, are there more? Yes, there are many. If, if Adams, is, uh, Adams has gone, um, the idea of um, putting a proposal together for CITES Appendix 1 listing for the Okapi. If he, have, if he has evidence of international trade, um, there's only one range state to consult, and, and that's <laughs> DRC. So if, if DRC put in a proposal, I can't see anyone opposing it, as long as there is evidence that there is international trade. Otherwise, they'll say, well, it's a domestic issue, deal with it internally. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's very important. Yeah, but he's is is left. So I'll I'll chase him yes. on that one separately. And I'm very surprised to hear that. I can't believe that Okapi is not on yes, Appendix One. Is just incredible. Yes, indeed. Yes. But, but it's only international trade that covers that CITES covers. And if there's no evidence for international trade, if it's being traded within the DRC, it's not a CITES issue. Of course. So. so yeah, that's what the key is. If he has evidence that it's been that, that meat or skins or oil or whatever he was talking about is going overseas, then there is a good reason for 
uh, listing it, and the deadline, as I put in the chat, for proposals is 17th of June. So it could be a fairly simple proposal, but he just needs to look at the format and fill in the, the sections, and, and ICCN can submit it as the CITES authority for DRC. Yes, it's a very good idea. I think Adam is joining now, so you can also. <laughs> is he coming back? Good. Hello, Adam? No. Yes, no. Yeah, I think Adam. Uh, let me check. Uh, just before he, he Adam is there. Yes, Adam is joining. Okay. Wait a second. <clears throat> If just I would like to say something just before um, uh, Adam takes the floor. Um, as I told you, I will. I'm preparing the the magazine biodiversity magazine next issue. So we will have time and opportunities to add because of course in one hour time it's very short to talk about all issues. The situation in in uh, DRC, as you explained very clearly, is very difficult, very complex to address. So, um, as I told you uh, lately, you can send me all the documents, articles, videos, interviews that you want, and we can make, we can present them in the, the next issue. It will be published, published I hope, in uh, the end of June or uh, something like the end of June, uh, the, the beginning of July. So, uh, and also, uh, I'm, I will try to have uh, an interview from Theodore Treffon, who has uh, done a, a very, very interesting work on, on bushmeat and a very interesting conference. Uh, so this is all. Uh, Adams, do you want to, to say something? You are the experts. I'm just here a facilitator. Are, are, we can't hear you, Adams. Do you, have you put the, the sound on? Yes, uh, I think just like I, I mentioned earlier, synergy is really needed in uh, the struggle that we involved in. Uh, the sanctuaries cannot function if we do not save these animals. We cannot save these animals if we do not have the necessary support that we need from our government, uh, from the donors, uh, from the volunteers we work with. So it becomes like a big synergy. And then, of course, we have you who is trying to get the work that we do out there and say to the world, this is what is being done. That is part of education. Because sometimes we think that education is only for uh, the people who are at the grassroots level, like in the community, near the national parks, and so on. Surprisingly, here at home, sometimes we even need to to educate our judges. We need to educate our prosecutors because these laws are laws which are not known. These laws are laws that are neglected. Some people feel like, okay, we need to focus on rape and other serious crimes and that what crime is nothing special to, to give attention. But there are implications. And these implications, somebody has got to be talking about them over and over again until it becomes second nature to say, this planet, we're not going to run it as dictators. We're going to, to be called to live with other beings on this planet. And this way, we're going to create that equilibrium, which is needed for the world to be conducive for all of us. That's, uh, thank you. You, you. This is a really, uh, you had a really powerful speech and really convincing, and I hope that the audience will be Dutch and perceptive to this, to all you, your um, explanations. Um, Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> no, you're welcome. So, uh, you, yeah, uh, just one thing uh, before uh, uh, we finish. Uh, this, you underlined, uh, Frank, you uh, underlined a very, very critical point, uh, which is that the Pan-African and also the international cooperation, you, so you, you have talked a lot about this, but what can be improved in, in this field? What do you think can be improved? What can we target uh, in particular about this? 
about the international cooperation and the, the Pan-African cooperation, because you, uh, Frank and you have pointed out that he has uh, done very uh, interesting outcomes, very successful outcomes from now on. So what, from now on, what can we, what are you expect, uh, your expectations on this? Do you, did you hear me? Did you hear me, Adams? Okay. Is that the question to me? I thought you were asking Frank. Oh, no, Frank. yes. You are someone exactly. who wants exactly. to answer. Yeah, there is so much that can be improved. Um, currently, we, we just did a case. We worked on a case with, uh, with some Indian investigators. It, this, these are people we've never met, and we were working remotely. And I can guarantee you it yielded the results that we needed. So we can share a lot of experience internationally. That is one, first. But also, secondly, internationally, we anticipate that uh, they can be able to give us some logistic as well as technical support. Uh, here in the DRC, we're in, in the middle of nowhere. There are places where you can come and rescue a pangolin, for instance. And just because you do not have adequate equipment, maybe to feed, just like, as simple as a bottle to feed an animal, that animal could die. And that is going to be wasted resources because, because uh, we have gotten through all the challenges, all the troubles in rescuing this animal. But just because of a little technical issue, we end up losing it. And this has happened to us uh, more than one time. And recently, we just received a feeding kit from a lady in South Africa, Nikki Wright. And that did us a lot of good. Uh, I remember the first time we rescued a chimp. We didn't even know how to feed it. And I think I spoke to Frank's wife, Roxane, uh, who sent us to another lady in Chimpunga in Congo Brazzaville. And before you knew it, there were tips which were being sent. But most recently, we received a manual from a lady who's based in Liberia, and which explains to us exactly step by step how to go about it. And these are just minor examples uh, that I can, I can give to you on how international lobbying is going to assist us. There shouldn't be a single individual who can say that because they have so much knowledge and experience they are going to tackle this problem head on alone. We are only going to win this game if we allow each and everyone to bring in their little expertise. And because we have common objectives, steadily we're going to see that we're going to hit it. But also, if we have this synergy, it's going to put us in a position whereby we scratch only where it itches. It means we are not going to double book anymore. It has happened before that we've been investigating a case that another organization has been investigating. And the clash sometimes can be fatal. But if we are talking amongst each other, we're going to avoid such incidences. And resources are going to be put exactly where they're supposed to be put instead of all of us working on just one thing, whereas we could work on 10. Okay, this is really, really interesting. Really, I, um, <laughs> I think, Adams, you, you, you hit several nails on the head in that intervention. Um, although cooperation between elements of civil society, you have to keep it to trusted partners, because obviously information, particularly relating to cases that are still active, um, mustn't leak. Um, I, I was really excited that this is being co-organized by the CBC GDF and Dr. Zhu's um, statement at the beginning about an ecological civilization being our, our goal is absolutely spot on. Um, and this is an example of civil society co collaborating. Um, but coming up later this year, uh, again with China hosting it, um, we have the opportunity for governments to collaborate. That's with the CBD COP15. And we heard so much about the, the climate talks, COP26, in Glasgow last year. 
and the media has completely got the message about climate. It's everywhere in the media. Almost nowhere do you see an equal recognition of the importance of biodiversity loss. But we cannot solve the climate crisis without functioning ecosystems, and we certainly can't um, keep our ecosystems functioning if we don't sort out the, the climate. So I think all of us as, as NGOs um, can help to, to make that connection um, which I put some comments in the chat box, but the, the, the point is we we have that opportunity, and, and as just as at COP26, um, the developed world governments, the G20, were 